Well, thank you, Tom. Um, these are certainly have been challenging times uh, for the organizations who've gathered here today for our members. And um, I think we've certainly risen to the challenge. Um, it's been an honor over the last seven months to engage with so many chambers and state uh, and metro areas and local chambers and industry associations as we've come together to, to help our members. And if there's one thing that's come out of it, it's a demonstration of the strength and importance of our federation. Uh, together, we have helped our members navigate uh, a pandemic and an economic downturn that are both unprecedented in any of our lifetimes. As they say, however, there's always more work to do, and that's why we're gathered here today. Much of that work centers around some of our smallest members, the backbones of our economy, those uh, businesses of Main Street, uh, those folks who take a risk uh, to open up their own shop, to open up their own place of employment and create most of the new jobs that our economy creates. Today, we are pleased to be with two experts on small business who will help us understand what our members face. But before I introduce them, I think it's important to take a moment and reflect on the news of the weekend. Um, whether you agree or disagree with her judicial opinions, uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, was a heavyweight of law. Um, her, her intellect, um, uh, her decency with respect to colleagues on both sides of the aisle, her personal story uh, serves as an inspiration for so many. And while Washington, as it tends to do, is quickly turned to uh, what comes next with respect to a Supreme Court vacancy, on that, we'll have more to say uh, in later days, but today is a day to think about her and remember her legacy and her inspiration. With that, let's get to the work that we have to do today, and it's an honor to introduce Hector Beretta, who served as the SBA Administrator under President George W. Bush and now serves as Chairman of the Latino Coalition, and Maria Contreras-Sweet, who served as the SBA Administrator under President Obama. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we couldn't be more pleased to have two experts, not only from your background in government, but having spoken with both of you over the years, I know that it's a passion that's never left you for small business and that you really are in touch with businesses across this country about what they're facing and what policymakers can be doing to help them. So let's start right there with you, Hector. Um, and then uh, Maria, I'll ask you the same question. What is it that our small businesses should expect over the next six months? Hector? Neil, thank you for having us and thanks everybody for joining us for this very special uh, program. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a natural optimist, Neil, uh, but we still have some rough sledding ahead of us. You know, we, we keep hearing that there could be a vaccine as early as next year, and that's going to be a key milestone. I think everybody's going to feel a lot more comfortable that we're uh, exiting this, this terrible uh, disaster that we've all been living through. You know, you're starting to see some positive signs, and they may be anecdotal, but big companies like J.P. Morgan are going back to the office. States are slowly opening up. Unemployment is going down. Uh, and, and many businesses, as Tom had mentioned at the front, have you know never closed or they've restarted their operations. Obviously, not at 100%. Um, and finally, you know, we're hopeful, and I and I, I know the chambers on the front end of this is that there still needs to be more help for these small businesses. So another PPP, uh, additional opportunities to get regular uh, disaster loans or capital access loans commitments that corporations are making, uh, the advocacy that chambers like U U.S. Chamber do, those are all part of the equation. So I'm cautiously optimistic. We're, we're not out of the, the woods yet. Maria, what are you hearing from uh, the small businesses that you talk to? Well, thank you. First of all, let me just say what a, what a pleasure it is to see my good friend Hector Barreto and being so vital and continue to play such an important role in our community. Um, but likewise, I've always admired the role that the chamber has played, um, having been in corporate community most of uh, my career, uh, my first 15 years of life as part of a corporation. I am so deeply grateful that now the business roundtable and the chamber are looking to expand the way in which they look at the world. Well, you know, the old view was that business is business is business. And now I'm so heartened to see that now businesses are saying that our role is to help shape society 
and if we and engage and be supportive of society and if we do a good job then profit should be our reward and so when the business roundtable took their expanded view and said it's not just about the primacy of shareholders but that now that their role and their view is to expand it to stakeholders which includes their supply chain which includes the community their employees and so many communities that have been disadvantaged uh, in their marketplace so first, let me just, I think it's important to note what a wonderful job businesses are doing today. But I would just like to say that in my mind, having been a small business person, started three different businesses, including a bank, that I, my prism has always been different. I feel that so oftentimes as chambers, we look at the small business community sometimes as an afterthought, sometimes as something that, oh, we've got to make sure we include small businesses. And my view has been that if smart bi small businesses are successful, then corporations are su successful. Our country is strong because it's the small businesses that create the vibrancy of our community. It's the distinguishing feature. It's the bakery. It's the restaurant. It's the artist in the local community that attracts tourism. And so I would just urge the chambers to engage not just the uh, local officials and the state officials, but federal officials to remind people that we have to look through the lens of small business first if we want to have a vibrant America that people want to enjoy and live in and have a quality of life. And so I would say that what I am seeing across America is a resiliency. Small businesses, by and large, have been reluctant to embrace government because that's why they're entrepreneurs, because they believe in freedom and flexibility and their own choosing their own future. And so what we need to do is make sure that we can build trust again in small businesses that they can rely on the governmental institutions to truly be helpful to them. Yeah, it's uh, it really is an ecosystem, if you will, right? So um, it's a and it's the biggest businesses, mid-sized businesses, and and small businesses. And if um, whether you describe it as an ecosystem or a three-legged stool, if you will, if one parts of it fails, the, the whole thing fails. And you know, one of the things that Tom mentioned in his opening is that you know now seven months kind of into this pandemic we're seeing some sectors uh, of the economy really able to recover that that top end of a, a k-shaped recovery if you will while other sectors um, the restaurants the bakeries maria that you just mentioned uh, continue to struggle talk a little bit of, if you will about how we should focus our energies or what you would recommend to those businesses who, because of social distancing and, and other public health requirements, maybe haven't been able to, to fully recover yet and are wondering uh, when the timeline is that they will be able to fully recover. Hector, we'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question, Neil. And, and, and you already know this. It, it depends. You know, uh, you know, all of our businesses are not in the same state. You know, I'm out here in California. I think Maria is also. And uh, we're opening up a little bit slower. And I think something that we've all learned, it's incumbent upon us, you know, to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And, you know, all businesses hate uncertainty. And we've never had as much uncertainty, at least in my recollection, as we're all living through right now. You know, you've heard that old saying, business prefers a yes and they can even accept a no but the maybes killed them and a lot of us feel like we're living in maybes depending on where we're at also as many of us know that are listening here we're very concerned about what's going to happen to some businesses that have been really stretched some of these businesses were already challenged before the pandemic i remember hearing a, a statistic i think it came from the metlife survey that this was a, a couple of months ago, that 25% of businesses felt that if they didn't get additional help before the end of the year, they may not make it. That would be a disaster for our economy, for our local communities, for employees, et cetera. And so the bottom line is, and I know the chamber is fighting for this every day, is a lot of these businesses need more help. And if they can get more help through, for example, maybe another round of PPP, or other incentives that can be provided, not only through the federal government, but through state governments, local governments, that's gonna be very helpful. Lastly, I think what we've all learned is there's so much that we cannot control. You know, we didn't create this, we didn't expect this, we didn't plan for this. So you really gotta focus on, on those things that you can control. Your expenses, 
the commitments that you're making, and you really need to start thinking about how to diversify your business. Just because you've been doing business a certain way for decades doesn't mean you're going to get to do that business the same way going forward. So new markets, new partnerships, new tools is going to be critically important. You know, uh, Hector, you, you remind me that um, it's our experience at the U.S. Chamber, and I, I think it's true for the state and local chambers uh, who are who are listening in today as well, is that part of our role um, was simply information sharing, that all of this was new. The pandemic was new. The response to the health crisis was new. How to navigate these brand new programs, PPP. Uh, many people had never heard of IDLE before, longstanding program, they hadn't heard of it before. And part of it was just the information and uh, chambers of commerce and other institutions were a source of information to help people navigate that. And it's a good reminder that maybe part of the role, even beyond a pandemic and an economic out downturn, is to be that information resource for small businesses. Maria, I mean, this is something you have a lot of experience in, both in starting businesses, but also helping others understand how they build businesses and the challenges that they face and learning from others. Can you comment a little bit about the role that associations like those who are gathered here today can kind of play in that important information exchange? And Neil, I think you hit it. I mean, it's spot on what you just said. I think what I just want to stress the importance of what you just said. Having been in state government as California Secretary of Transportation, and then later as a, as a banker, uh, having clients and customers, and then of course as the uh, cabinet member on the president's cabinet over SBA, I can tell you that what small businesses need most is some reliable consultation, some reliable source of information. Because as I said, they need to trust institutions because they've been so frustrated by everything. And so sure, government, these, uh, these programs right now that were, you know, the PPP, I was happy to give some input into how some of it could be framed. Some thoughts were incorporated, most weren't. Uh, but um, I, was, I was a little frustrated that uh, the sole provider was thought, you know, about later. And so they couldn't apply until, you know, in round one, many banks were already out of capital. So there were some, you know, fits and starts that we had to work through. But by and large, you know, I think it is helping some small businesses. But what I think is an enduring role that small uh, chambers can play or big chambers can play across the country is to make sure that we're taking the long view of things. That is that small businesses need, yes, some short term fix. Our numbers are similar to what I just heard. I'm working with the Gallup uh, polling people and, they, and uh, we've confirmed that 25 percent of small businesses probably will will not come back online after 30 days. But after 90 days, about 50% of them may not come online. And so we really need to think about how we can fully support them. So I say that it's a it's a got to be a multiple, multiple prong strategy. When I see contracting at the federal level at 23%, I said when I was in office, it should be the floor, not the ceiling. So we got to a 25.5% in contracting goals with the federal government. So small businesses need to think about contracting to diversify the portfolio with the federal government, but have same policies at state level. So chambers can play an important role, amplifying the voice and advocating for a small business procurement program in every state across the country and even cities and counties so that we can diversify the portfolio. The, the other part is, which is really frustrating and chambers can play a very important role, is access to capital. Today, we know that venture capital is concentrated in three states. California, Massachusetts, and New York, and only 25 zip codes. We know that the best ideas are not concentrated in, in 25 zip codes, and particularly for women who only get two to 4% of that venture capital. So I believe that if we advocate to make sure that women and people of color and everybody in rural America also can access capital, that would be a sea change and encourage resiliency. You know, Maria, it's interesting. We know that the capital that goes into those venture funds isn't all concentrated in those 25 zip codes either. I've been fascinated talking to some of my colleagues in, in state and metro chambers who go to, to, to people of means in their neighborhoods, you know, uh, uh, kind of the, the local titans of industry, and they're making investments well beyond their community, even beyond their state, and talking to them about how they create some of that venture capital 
for the community that they live in. And I think that's a, a really key point and an opportunity, frankly, uh, for all of us who are gathered here. Uh, it's not just about shopping local and you know Small Business Sunday uh, you know, that, that we celebrate every November. We also ought to be investing local, whether that's individual investors or, or banks and, and buying local, whether that's ourselves or, or companies and local and state governments that can supply. Right, we are referring to um, private capital, and I think that's an important point that you just made. But remember that lots of the funds, most of the funds are made of our pensions, you know, employee pensions. And so sometimes I think that these brokers, these gatekeepers forget that it's our money, that it's our capital. And so they, they treat it as though their own and this, you know, and they go after their preferences versus thinking, I'm a gatekeeper, I'm a representative and a steward of the public employees capital. And how do I make sure I'm living up to that stewardship, that requirement and obligation that I have? That's true. Yeah. And Hector, I know this is something that you're passionate about, um, uh, particularly with respect to uh, minority and underserved communities as well. What are some of the things that our audience should be thinking about that they can work on to, to, to you know, really address some of the tragic numbers that we're beginning to hear about business closures in for minority owned firms and in minority communities. Yeah, it's a it's a big issue. And, you know, many of us have been following these trends for a long time. When you think about it, the fastest growing segment of small business are these emerging businesses. Latino companies represent 4 million enterprises, $700 billion in revenue every single year. Demographers think those numbers could double every five years. Uh, that is incredible. That's an incredible infusion of energy, ideas, uh, talent to the economy. Latinas, women, Maria knows very all about this, are starting businesses five times faster than any other group. We want to keep that momentum going. And those small businesses need the same thing that every business needs. The first thing they need is more business. So to Maria's point, if we can help them get more contracts through the government or through corporate America, that is critically important. They need an environment so that not only that they get started, but they can grow over the long term. In a lot of places, we're seeing that that environment could be challenged even after we come out of the pandemic. So we can't take our eye off that ball either. Um, and, and at the end, you know, when we think about these markets, these are not niche markets. These are not special markets. These are the fastest growing markets in the world. So it's a great opportunity for non-minority businesses to also partner with these businesses, utilize these businesses. But our economy cannot continue to be the envy of the world if these businesses are not fortified, if they're not helped to stay in business uh, past those first few years when we still lose too many businesses. 50% of businesses go out of business in the first four years. It may be more than that now. So there's incredible challenges, but there's incredible opportunities and a great place for us all to be part of the solution. So uh, speaking of solutions, we have a few minutes left and we have about a thousand uh, state and local and industry association, state and local chamber and industry association leaders on the line right now. Um, they serve both a role in their communities, as we just talked about, but they also engage policymakers. I was uh, uh, with the, the Greater Waco Chamber earlier today and uh, the Pittsburgh Chamber uh, before that this morning. And they were both doing something really interesting. They were lobbying at the same time, their local, their state, and their federal lawmakers and bringing them together. So uh, in the last few moments we have left, I want to turn to, to both of you to say, what advice do you have for these association leaders, both about what they can be doing in their communities and how they ought to be engaging in the public policy process um, at the federal, the state, and the local level? And Hector, we'll start with you and we'll give Maria the last word. Great. And by the way, it was great to be with you, Maria and, and Chamber. Thank you for doing this, uh, this uh, panel. Look, uh, the chambers are the cavalry and the U.S. Chamber and the local chambers and state chambers have always been on the front lines, but they're needed more now than ever. They really are the trusted advisors. And we're going to get past this pandemic. But that doesn't mean that things are going to go back to normal right away. It's going to take some time. We could have another challenging year next year, not as difficult as this year is. So 
we need to keep our eye on the ball in terms of creating that environment. We are having elections. There will be new administrations. And we need to make sure that we elevate our issues and keep them on the radar screen. You know, all elected officials like to talk about how great we are. They just don't always vote our interest. And we need to make sure that they know that our interests are permanent, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of our country and our economy going forward. Maria? Yeah, I'll just um, just say that um, that's exactly right. I believe that uh, we need to take the long view of things. And with elections, that was just reference. You know, we know that there's a turn there and in corporations, we are getting shorter and shorter term views sometimes because of CEO changing and, and the stock market and that sort of thing. So we need somebody who has the long view and that is the role of the chamber. So I would remind you that you have the long view and you have most trust in your membership. And so I ask you, implore upon you to think about market making for your, your small businesses. 99% of consumers outside of the United States, and often we forget about that marketplace. You know, traveling with the president or, you know, around the world, the people in Estonia who said to me how concerned they were if uh, they weren't looking to the West, what could happen if, if uh, some of our, you know, Russian partners invaded them again. And so they were very concerned about that. The people in Spain who were just learning about a second chance and how to file bankruptcy so you could have risk capital. I could tell you stories all around the world, the way we work with FARC in Colombia to stabilize their, their uh, country and bring about peace for the first time in 50 years. So it's a global marketplace, that's number one, to remember that if we can have missions and uh, travel to make sure that we're capturing all of the market and make sure that we respect the role that uh, Henry Ford taught us when he said that uh, he could build cars, but if he didn't pay his employees well enough, to be able to have employees who could afford to buy the car, then uh, to what to what end? And so we have to make sure that as businesses, we are treating our employees fairly to make sure they can afford to buy our, our products. But also, as we think about this, we have a role as the small business community to make sure that we are communicating to our electeds because we wanna make sure that we have a peaceful process about our sub and civil engagement. Other countries look to us. I mean, I've seen so many of them. We don't want to become a despotic, authoritarian country. We need to make sure that we have a peaceful way of life so that we can deepen democracy domestically and abroad, expand the middle class, which is the small business community. And I'll just close by telling you my story and why I'm personally passionate about this and why we're still doing so much work around this space. Uh, you heard me say, and, and I was obviously I'm a Latina. I was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. I came here at the age of five, and certainly there was no government or large institution who was going to give my mother a job, non-English speaking, or me at five years old. And so it was a small business who paved the way for my brothers, my sisters, and my mother. And it was a small business who gave me my first opportunity. And my grandmother always said as I progressed, she said, it's not the titles you have, it's what you do with the titles you have. And so I've taken that to heart. And, uh, and so when I wrote to her and said, a grandma, I'm now the fourth grade milk monitor, she said, remember. So and clearly when I became secretary, she said, I always knew that you could work in an office and become a secretary. But I didn't know that you would hold office and be a cabinet secretary. That's the prosperity, the stories that we can tell in our country that we need to replicate. And it's entrepreneurship is the story and the way we can do this for all Americans. Thank you very much for hosting this event. Well, thank you, Maria, and thank you, Hector, and uh, thank you both for your service uh, in government, but perhaps even more importantly, your service outside of government and your willingness to continue to be a resource uh, to small business owners across the country and an inspiration, uh, Maria in particular, uh, and Hector as well, uh, to those folks who are just starting out and wondering if they can make it and hanging up their own shingle. Uh, they can look to both of you and uh, they can see what's possible and what's possible uh, here in America. So thank you both for joining us. You know, um, as we uh, 